first off, a huge shout out and thanks to the organizers for putting together this wonderful symposium and especially Andrew. Uh, Yale is a big campus and so forums like these are <clears throat> a wonderful opportunity for folks like me who develop methods and who have background in computer science and mathematics to connect with folks who are actually trying to solve really difficult problems and have exciting and surprising data uh, for us to work with. And so today I'm gonna try and convince you in 10 minutes that uh, geometry is really important. And in particular, no matter what sort of data you work with, uh, it's geometry, it's shape is something that you can uh, utilize in building machine learning architectures that are going to outperform other methods. I'm not gonna present any specific results today. I'm just simply going to describe a problem solving approach that we have developed in the Krishna Swami lab uh, to look at drug discovery and indication expansion. So let's try by, let's, let's start by beginning to understand the scale of the problem. And so molecules, they come in all shapes and sizes. I've put four molecules up on the screen for you. If you recognize any one of these molecules, raise your hand. Uh, this breaks even chemists, maybe. I see like a couple of raised hands. Maybe you recognize caffeine on the left. This is aspirin on the right, penicillin, and dopamine. And so we know that the shape of the molecules, their atomic composition, their three-dimensional structure is what really contributes to the properties of these molecules. And some of these molecules are things that we like, things like caffeine, aspirin, penicillin. But if we consider all possible molecules that you could potentially assemble from all the elements that are available to us in the periodic table, you come up with a number that's really, really big. It's 10 to the 60. This number is bigger than the size of the known universe. So to find the next compound that's going to cure maybe Alzheimer's, that's going to cure maybe breast cancer in such a large space is a really, really tricky problem to solve. And so what people generally do, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, is you hire a team of chemists, you have them build lots of compounds for you, and you can construct libraries that are quite large. You can construct a library of a million compounds, and then you screen these compounds against whatever target or disease that you care about, and you come up with molecules that you consider hits. These are molecules that are showing some promise towards curing the symptoms of the disease, and then you can engage with your medicinal chemistry team to develop these compounds further into advanced compounds that you can then take through clinical trials. More recently, what folks have started doing is they develop virtual libraries. These are libraries of molecules that exist on a computer. And so on a computer, you have lots more space to work with. So you can construct larger libraries of around a billion molecules, maybe 10 billion molecules. And then you can perform some kind of physics-based simulation. Uh, you can dock these molecules to some target. You can measure interactions. And you can come up with a se sequence of virtual hits. And these are the hits that you can then synthesize and then you can run assays to develop advanced compounds. But even these virtual libraries, the largest of these are around the order of 10 to the 10. This is still many, many, many orders of magnitude smaller than 10 to the 60, which is a chemical space we want to be considering. So this is where machine learning can help. And I'll show you how it can help. So consider, for instance, an architecture where you take your input molecule here and you feed it through an encoder architecture. The encoder is just some neural network and you come up with some representation of that molecule. It's a numerical representation. How do we know that this numerical representation is good? Well, we simultaneously train a decoder architecture that takes that representation as its input and it recovers back the original molecule. If I train this architecture by itself, this representation in the middle is going to capture the structure of the molecule. That's not sufficient. I want to know what sort of properties are associated with this structure. So to organize this space by both structure and properties, what I can do is I can train another network that takes this representation as its input and learns to predict properties of that molecule. Now we have all the ingredients we need to come up with new molecules that have desirable properties. Because what I can do then is I can navigate in this space, which we call the latent space, and I can optimize for specific properties of these molecules and come up with a latent representation that corresponds to those optimized properties. I can then take that latent representation, 
feed it through the decoder, and voila, I have a new molecule that has those optimized properties. Easy for me to say and present in one slide, very difficult to do in practice. And the devil is really in the details. It's in how you actually choose to represent these molecules. And we think we have the right way of representing the molecules where other architectures like graph neural networks have failed in the past. So Sarah already introduced uh, graphs in the context of protein-protein interaction networks, but for me, graphs are going to represent molecules. So I'm gonna have a graph that consists of a set of vertices, which are going to be atoms in the molecule and edges that are going to represent bonds between those molecules. Could be covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, whatever. And standard way of representing these graphs is, is through an adjacency matrix. On the graph itself, I have a signal. And this signal is going to tell me which node in the graph is a carbon atom, which node is an oxygen atom, which node is a nitrogen atom, and so forth. So I have a graph and I have a signal on the graph. And what I wanna learn is how that signal is distributed over the graph. So a little bit of mathematics here, but what I can do is I can consider random walks on the graph. So I have this random walk matrix P where starting from any given node or any given atom in the graph, I stay at that node with probability one half. And with probability one half, I visit one of my neighboring nodes. So if I take this matrix P and I raise it to some power, I perform, like let's say I raise P to the T, then I'm performing a T-step random walk on the graph. And so what, we, you, what you can do is you can use these matrices P you can raise them to various dyadic scales and subtract them from each other, and you can construct a bank of wavelets. If you're familiar with things like Fourier analysis or wavelet analysis in continuous time and continuous uh, space domain, this is nothing but a discretization of that concept to this graph setting. And then what you can do is you can take that input signal and you can convolve it with your wavelet filter bank to come up with some representation of that graph. And then you can just take that representation and do all sorts of tasks. You can do graph classification, graph regression, node classification, and node regression. There's one problem. And the problem is, how do we know which exponents we want to raise P to, right? That will depend on the size of the input graphs. Are my molecules big? Are they small? Well, in machine learning, we don't really have an answer, so you just learn the answer. And so this complicated looking diagram is saying that what we, what we can do is we can take P and we can raise it to various dyadic scales. And then we can let the architecture take like a linear combination of P's raised to various dyadic scales and figure out what are the correct scales to be looking at in order to represent that input molecule. If this didn't make any sense, let me actually show you a quick application of this. And the application I'm gonna consider is age-related macular degeneration. This is a healthy human eye. This is where light enters the eye through the optical disc. And we have macula, which is the region at the back of the eye on the retina where light gets focused. And so in this disease, in macular degeneration, what happens is you have uh, this protein drusen that's deposited near the macula and it interferes with your peripheral vision. There's another form of the disease called wet AMD where there's some hemorrhaging that's taking place and in wet AMD, it's a kind of a more severe form of this disease, which unfortunately leads to blindness. As it happens, most of the approved molecules for dry AMD are small molecules, and most of the approved kind of treatments for wet AMD are biologics. And our architecture works for both of these. I'm simply going to show you some results for uh, dry AMD with small molecules. So remember how I showed you, you feed these molecules through the encoder and you learn some latent representation? Well, we can visualize what that latent representation looks like. And so this is just a 2D visual where every single point in the diagram is one molecule in our input data set. Now, if I take some of these molecules and I print them out for you, you will see that molecules that are close to each other in this latent space are structurally similar. This is something you would expect simply because we are encoding structural information in our architecture fundamentally. What you'll also notice is that the color in this plot is smooth, is varying smoothly. And the color here is indicating how efficacious these molecules are at curing the oxidative stress that comes from dry AMD. 
So this latent space that I'm visualizing here is jointly organized by the structure of the molecules and their property. And it's smooth with respect to both structure and property. So once you have this beautiful latent space, you can then do all sorts of wonderful things. For example, I can start from some point in this latent space and I can move towards any other point in the latent space. And as I'm moving towards that point, I can decode the structures along the way. And so this gives you a nice smooth latent interpolation where this is a molecule that's part of the training data set that I'm starting from. This is a molecule part of the training data set that I'm ending with. And all the molecules in the middle are being generated by the architecture. And just visually, I hope you'll agree with me, the molecules at the beginning of this trajectory are similar to the one that I'm starting with, and molecules at the end are similar to the one that I'm gonna end with. So you can perform this nice latent interpolation in this space. But we have also learned fundamentally how to connect the structure of these molecules to their properties. And that allows us to do property optimization. Now I'm not gonna reveal what are molecules that we optimize for AMD. I mean, that's IP that I wanna protect. I'll just show you a simple example where I'm taking these three molecules and I'm going to optimize their molecular weight and solubility. And so these molecules on the right are molecules that are generated by the architecture. It has never seen these molecules before. We're going from left to right. I'm decreasing the molecular weight in the top row. I'm increasing solubility in the middle row. And in the last row, I'm making the molecule more saturated. So I'm getting rid of the double bonds. So it doesn't matter whether your property is a continuous thing like molecular weight or solubility, or whether it's a discrete thing like number of saturated rings in the molecule, you can use this architecture to come up with optimized molecules. You can do multi-property optimization. You can keep some properties the same and tweak just the properties that you want to tweak. And I hope again, you'll agree with me that even as we are optimizing these molecules to lower their molecular weight, we are trying really hard to preserve the structure of the molecules. This is something that only our architecture can do because we have fundamentally learned the mapping between the structure and the functionality or the properties of these molecules. I wanna end by just talking about how you can consider using this architecture for things like indication expansion or for uh, discovering the mechanism of action or targets. The way you would do this is you would start with maybe a set of molecules from a large screen that you, you're interested in and some molecules that are already FDA approved. For the FDA approved molecules, we know which targets these molecules bind to and what is their mechanism of action. So all we have to do is take molecules from our screen and take these FDA approved molecules and learn their latent representation together. I can then take a molecule from my screen and I can find its nearest FDA approved molecules in that latent space. And we can assume, we can hypothesize that those two molecules are going to share the same target and the same mechanism of action. So you can use this, this, this architecture to take molecules from your screen and repurpose them to a new uh, disease or to uh, figure out what their mechanism of action might look like. Um, that's all I have for you today. Happy to take any questions and talk to you afterwards. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Super interesting. We have uh, any questions from the audience to start out with? So I, I'll just have a question just to start out. Where do you all, where do you see this going like the next six months to two, kind of two years in your, your research and what are you kind of hoping to do next? Yeah, so I think I only shared with you like one aspect of the story. I talked about small molecules. Uh, the other aspect of the story are the targets that they bind to, right? So there's this idea of like Doug target interaction. And so what I'd like to do is, you know, have two copies of this architecture, one copy that's running on the small molecules or ligands and another copy that's operating on targets. And so you can learn an embedding of the small molecule and the target together, and then you can use it to do drug target interactions. You could also potentially use this, uh, for example, to look at viral evolution, right? So you can have like, the, the viral spike protein that you embed with this architecture for multiple patients. And then in that latent space, you can figure out how that virus is evolving over time. 
And so to the extent that you're using time as the property that you're predicting from the latent embeddings, you can learn to forecast viral evolution. So there's like a wide variety of possibilities where you combine this architecture or have multiple copies of this architecture running for you know, small molecules or biologics, or maybe even combine it with other transformer-based, sequence-based architectures where you are leveraging both sequence information and structural information together uh, and then doing property prediction or optimization. Super interesting. Questions from the audience? So one other question, and this is me trying to like link it back to the clinical space. You know, I think sometimes we think about patients moving through kind of the clinical space and having different pathways. And it seems like there would be some type of applicability here, finding like optimized kind of pathways and approaches to patients and looking at it from an outcome standpoint. Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, it's not an area that I'm actively considering, but imagine, for example, you have like patients who are undergoing chemotherapy and, and you're measuring whether or not they're performing well over time or, you know, they're maybe becoming resistance to chemotherapy. And so you could potentially like train an architecture that uses the drug embeddings here as a conditional input and learns to predict patient trajectories. And so if you build that, that sort of architecture, you can then begin to ask questions like, okay, what is the right cocktail of molecules that I should be using? Or can you come up with more optimized molecules that will give me the desired trajectory for a given patient? So you can try to make these things more patient specific, but I think that's a little bit further uh, down the road from where, where we are at at the moment. We'd like to validate this with experimental data and apply it to like proteins and, and viruses first before moving on to that stage where we are developing patient-specific models. Thank you. Awesome.